Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brainwaves. I'm Brandon Staglin, your host. With post-traumatic stress estimated to afflict close to 8% of Americans in general and up to 18% of veterans returning from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, research to better treat this condition is an especially important topic right now. Dr. Michael Fanslow is a longtime leader in the study of this condition, and he's also the Staglin Family Chair in Psychology and Director of the Staglin Family Music Festival Center for Brain and Behavioral Health at UCLA. Uh, these are both emro funded programs, so thank you to EMRO donors for that. Uh, he's going to share with us about his research and I'll, uh, probably also offer some hope for new treatments for these conditions. And uh, Dr. Michael Fanslow, thank you so much for appearing on Brainwaves today and welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, great to talk to you. So uh, I've got some questions for you uh, and I'll, I'll just jump right in. So you've studied the biology behind the formation of fears for almost 30 years now. And what initially drew you to this study? And why is it so important for understanding how to better treat mental health conditions like post-traumatic stress? So uh, what initially drew, drew me to the whole field was the idea that how you can have an experience and that will change who you are in a fundamental way. It changes how you behave. It physically changes your brain. So now you're a different person after an experience. And with something like, you know, um, a frightful experience, a traumatic experience, this can have such an amazingly powerful effect on who we are and, you know, how we act um, and how our brain functions that it just seemed to be, you know, this incredibly exciting topic to, to study from a scientific point of view. Plus then it offers the hope that we can actually, you know, get the brain back to where it should be, get it back to the healthy state where it's doing these wonderful things as opposed to the problems it can create after an experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic. And uh, so, um, you know, as your team published this year, uh, you're, you've successfully tested a new rodent model of post-traumatic stress, and it, it seems to emulate the process behind how fear can create post-traumatic stress in, in people. Mm -hmm. And why is this, this model the most accurate yet developed? And what does it reveal about the biology behind the condition and, and also hopefully how to treat uh, human PTS? Sure. Um, so one important thing I think we have to realize is that um, we need animal models to really get in to see because we think, you know, what's happening is the brain is changing and we need a way to see what those changes are. And so animal models allow us to do that. I think my own research has really shown us that, you know, after we provide a traumatic experience, a very frightening experience to the animal, and look at what and that happens in post-traumatic stress, we're really recreating much of, the, of what can happen when a person experiences something really, really strong like that. And we think two things are happening um, that really contribute to post-traumatic stress. One is that we form very frightening memories that when we recall the things that happen, they can really take over and debilitate us. And those are triggered by anything that can remind us of, of the experience. But there's also an aspect that happens with these experiences that's independent of the actual, our actual memory. And that is that, you know, there's a particular change in how we will um, react to future events, even if they're just slightly stressful. And so when that, in that paper you mentioned, we showed that you know, this trauma really changes how you, you react now to things that wouldn't necessarily cause a fear reaction or condition a fear reaction, now are turned into very significant, intensely fear-provoking stimuli. And one of the advantages to our model is that it captures both this, this, these changes, what we'll call stress sensitization, and it also captures the, the memory effects, the sort of associative learning, you know, oh, this is like what I had in the traumatic stress, and it's bringing back these memories. And our model co uniquely combines both of those in a very rigorous scientific way so we can really measure what's going on, also get into the brain and see what's going on, and then look for things that can reverse those kinds of treatments. So that's, you know, um, I think one of the exciting things about the, the model, as you asked. What we've been able to... I, identify, and this is another paper we just recently published, it, are a few things. What has to happen to cause these, these changes and where those changes are occurring? And so we identified certain things that physiologically are communicated to a particular region of the brain, the amygdala, that's very important for 
sort of coordinating and generating our fear reactions. And those things that are communicated to the amygdala, sort of the physio physiological changes, change what the amygdala is doing. It creates proteins, you know, that sh are not, shouldn't be there to the extent that they're there, and it causes these very long-term changes in these proteins. And now when any information comes into the amygdala, the animal will overreact. It will treat that as an incredibly fear-provoking and stressful stimulus, even, even if it's not that particularly stressful. So what's really exciting then is we know some of the things that are happening to tell the, the brain to change in this way, cause these physiological changes. And since we, we've identified what some of those changes are, we can figure out ways to sort of reverse them. And so what we want to do is get the, the amygdala functioning in the range that it should be functioning to protect us and not to debilitate us. So, so that makes great sense. Wow. Uh, and then, so you're working on even another cool paper about uh, a computer model. Uh, so you work with animal models, but you're also working with a computer model that mm -hmm. might help to improve uh, the uh, behavioral therapies for anxiety disorders in general. And uh, that, that sounds like a really great innovation. How, how does that work and how might it help? So what you want to do is, as you learn about how these brain regions function, to de develop basically a model of what's going on. So you de basically emulate um, with artificial intelligent neurons. So instead of real neurons, we have computer neurons to model what's happening in the brain and how the brain is processing this information. And so we've built um, models for really two different parts. One is the amygdala and also another part of the brain, which is the hippocampus, which um, really sets the context for things to happen, tells us where things are going to happen and what the context is. And so we have, we, we built two models that we think are capturing the properties of how the brain is working, one, one for the amygdala, one for the hippocampus. And now the thing is, um, remember I said that one component in post-traumatic stress and in, and in anxiety disorders in general are these fear memories, right? And what behavior therapy tries to do is to change those fear memories. So when we see these stimuli, we don't react in a fearful way when we shouldn't be reacting in a fearful way. But what the model allows us to do is to say, how should you pace therapy? How should you organize it? You know, should there be um, short episode, many short episodes or seeing a long episode? And because we can present these alternatives to the model, the model can do its churning on that and tell us which will be more effective. And that allows us then to construct hypotheses, which we can take back both to the clinic and to the laboratory and test those hypotheses that's generated by, okay, how this model is saying the brain is functioning. So it gives us a lot of power to improve things um, and do so in a, you know, a more rapid way rather than just using hunches. We really have a very accurate way to say, oh, this change should be important. And then we can see if it really is. Oh, well, thank you so much for answering all these questions. If people have any questions for you after I post this recording on your Brainways page, I, will you be ready to answer some questions? Yeah, I'd be very happy to. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Michael Fanslow, yeah. and uh, you have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. Great. Great talking to you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.